Greetings, it is I, C3 Sabretooth, and I've halfway dreaded making this video ever since Lee Wilson released his Halo 2 storyboards. But this is important. At least to me. And since I suck at introductions, I figured I should open this video with a little story. In 2009, video game developer Ensemble Studios officially closed its doors, with the real-time strategy game Halo Wars being both its final game and only foray into the Halo universe. But initially, Ensemble had planned to produce another entry in the Halo franchise, a massively multiplayer online role-playing game codenamed Titan. From the looks of it, you'd be able to pick your character species and class, and you'd be divided into factions of good guys and bad guys, you know, standard MMO stuff. Allegedly, the game was to take place in the Age of the Forerunners, so the UNSC and Covenant presence in the game was likely the result of time travel. Not much of the game's materials are available online, but from what's out there, the Halo community has largely reached the consensus that Ensemble was heading in the wrong direction. I actually quite like the stylized look, but the new species and character classes do look wildly out of place in the universe we know. That said, some of this is clearly early ideation and wouldn't necessarily reflect the finished product. Nobody can truly say how this game would have turned out had it been continued to completion. But I bring all this up because in this mix of radical artistic liberties, Ensemble Studios designed a species we all knew but had not yet seen. After all, how could you set your game in the age of the Forerunners without having the Forerunners? Let's see what crazy design they came up with. Huh. Ensemble's artists appear to have been on a creative overdrive. If they truly had the opportunity to design the species in any manner they liked, do you really think they would have gone with this? No, they may have been pushing the boundaries, but they were still working within the confines of the universe they were given. And in that universe, humans were Forerunner. Yes, in Bungie's universe, the ancient and mysterious Forerunners were the progenitors of the human race. Following the activation of the Array and its obliteration of the galaxy's sentient life, the Forerunners reintroduced these species back into the Milky Way, including their own, ensuring that their species would re-emerge on the third planet from Sol. Their successors would have to start over from scratch, building a new civilization from the ground up. And in the interim, Forerunner constructs across the galaxy would maintain stewardship over their maker's technology, just waiting for their creators to one day return and reclaim it. Now, 343 Industries obviously went in a different direction. Early in their possession of the Halo IP, 343 Industries released a trilogy of books known as the Forerunner Saga, in which humanity and the Forerunners are depicted as two distinct species that coexisted a hundred millennia ago. Their subsequent games and media continued this vision. You can like this change or dislike it. The only wrong answer is to deny that this was a change at all, which unfortunately appears to be the universal position of 343's fanbase. Back in my Combat Evolved video, I made a comment joking about the impossibility of the OG Halo 2 script's release. And while we're at it, how about the original Halo 2 script too? This is 160 pages worth of cinematics. Also a unicorn, might as well tack that onto my wish list of impossible things. Now I, I wasn't saying this to be coy or to galvanize former Bungie employees into proving me wrong. I genuinely believed that we would never see the release of materials confirming the contents of Halo 2's original ending. Because I already knew what it was. As I described in the end of the Halo 2 Act 2 video, Halo 2's lost ending. For years, all we've known is that it would take us back to the ruins of New Mombasa, and what would later come to be the portal at Voy was actually the Ark itself. And on that Ark, there would be a big reveal. Yeah, a big reveal taking place on a 100,000-year-old Forerunner Ark in East Africa, where modern humans originated about 100,000 years ago. I wonder what we'll learn. Yeah, you don't have to be a master detective to figure that one out. So, imagine my surprise when Lee Wilson saw that first video and uploaded his entire library of Halo 2 storyboards to ArtStation. And upon seeing it, the first thing I did was scroll through the posting like crazy, because there was no way he actually included the... There it is. And I am now making this video to coincide with the release of my animated reconstruction of that scene. Quickly summarized for those who haven't watched it. 
In that version, the Ark, which is a structure on Earth, begins tearing itself apart upon successfully deactivating the array. Our heroes split up, and the Arbiter follows Guilty Spark to the Ark's central chamber, the Data Vault. Apparently, the Ark has been transmitting data across humanity's homeworld for the past hundred millennia, the source of which being a large sarcophagus at the vault center. Keith David, voice of the Arbiter, even recorded the dialogue for the following revelation. This is a forerunner. It turns out that the Forerunner who activated the Array kept their species from extinction by using this data vault to become a template for a new race of Forerunner. Humanity. The resultant fusion of Forerunner genetics and native Earth life. While the precise mechanism of the Forerunner's meddling in human development was ultimately never canonized, and this specific scene was cut from Halo 2, the underlying fact was not. This was Bungie's canon. And look, I really don't want to make enemies in this community, because I know we're all Halo fans here, but the amount of misinformation around this topic is staggering. I'm not expecting you to blindly accept that I'm correct and so many others are wrong, but I am asking you to sit through this video and make an informed conclusion for yourself. I may be a cartoon character with pointy shoes, purple pants, and awesome hair, but I also know an awful lot about Halo, and I think I know what I'm talking about. So, when 3 for 3 Industries took over the Halo franchise, they changed a lot of things. One difference that is immediately visually apparent is the change of art style seen in Halos 4 and 5. By and large, I'm not a big fan of the artistic direction 3 for 3 Industries chose, and I'm glad they reversed course for Halo Infinite, but that's just my personal opinion. My opinion isn't any better or more valid than those who do, and I take no issue when people say they liked or preferred this art style. I do take issue, though, when people say there was no art style change at all. And yes, people do. For example, in Bungie's Halo, Forerunner architecture looked like this, and 3 for 3 redesigned it to look like this. A certain subset of people will say that no, this isn't a redesign. The Forerunner architecture seen in Bungie's games is reflective of the builder rate. This is the cast of Forerunners responsible for building the ring worlds and the Ark. The Forerunner architecture seen in 343's output between 2012 and 2021 is the architectural style favored by Warrior Servants, which is a different cast of Forerunners. So, 343 Industries didn't redesign Forerunner architecture, they simply used a different style of architecture to denote facilities created by a different cast of Forerunners. Except this isn't true at all. If that were the case, why does 343's depiction of Installation 03 have Warrior Servant architecture? Why does Installation 09? Those are both builder facilities according to 3 for 3's own lore. Better yet, why did the Ark change architectural styles between studios so that it now reflects the wrong cast of Forerunner? Also, Genesis, the Forerunner planet we visit in Halo 5, it clearly uses their redesigned architecture. Is this a warrior servant planet? Because I seem to remember Exuberant Witness saying, This is a builder facility after all. I was installed by the Builders. I serve the Builders. It's incredible how awful that argument is. I'm not even passing judgment, I'm just saying that 343 three changed it, and they're responding with a counterclaim that isn't true most of the time. Another example. In Bungie's games, the elites look like this. And in Halos 4 and 5, 343 three redesigned them to look like this. These same people will say that 3 for 3 didn't redesign the elites. This is intended to be a different subspecies of St. Healy that we had simply never seen in Bungie's games. Okay, so if this is supposed to be a different subspecies of St. Healy, then why does the Arbiter look like that now, too? I'll then hear the argument that the only reason the Arbiter looks like the wrong subspecies of St. Healy is because this incorrect model was the only asset 343 three had. I'm not a game developer, but I can't imagine it taking that much time to put a different mesh on that elite rig. Heck, they probably could have imported the Elite model from Halo 2 Anniversary if their artists truly did not have the time. But even discounting that, why does the Arbiter appear to be the same subspecies in the Halo Escalation comic series, then? Why does all of Halo 5's concept art show him as the incorrect subspecies of Elite? I'm sorry if I'm shattering your world here, but this was a redesign of the Elites. And I understand that 3 for 3 Industries is now claiming that their design exists alongside Bungie's version. Though I believe they're saying it's just a different phenotype, not a whole new subspecies. 
But that assertion is clearly demonstrably retroactive, so saying that this wasn't an art style change is pretty obviously untrue. One final example, the UNSC Forward Unto Dawn. This is a change that I have absolutely no qualms with. In Halo 3, the Forward Unto Dawn was quite small, measuring about 500 meters in length. The piece the Master Chief is aboard is half that. This is way too small to fit in an entire campaign level, so 343 redesigned the frigate and quintupled its size in order to accommodate one. I'm on 343's side here, I wholly understand their reason for changing it, and it's not like the size of the ship was relevant to the plot of Halo 3, so it's no harm, no foul. But then, these same people will start claiming that no, 343 didn't redesign the frigate and quintuple its size. The reason why the Forward Unto Dawn is so much bigger in Halo 4 in comparison to its Halo 3 counterpart is because this massive, level-sized frigate was the only asset they had. That excuse doesn't even sort of make sense here. They believe that 343 Industries wanted their opening level to take place on this much smaller Halo 3 style Forward Unto Dawn, but either ran out of time to create it or disk based to store it. But, lucky for them, they already had a campaign level sized asset of a different torn in half frigate, including both the exterior and interior, that was just sitting there, taking up disk space. 343 was then forced to use this asset as an opening level because they didn't have the time or disk space to create a model of the ship a fifth of that size. Does any part of that make sense to you? I almost resent having to provide evidence that this claim isn't true because it's so obviously untrue, but guess what? The Art of Halo 4 includes written interviews with 343's artists discussing their approach to redesigning the Forward Unto Dawn, which is an event they're claiming never happened. There! Debunked. This is so stupid. And again, I have absolutely no problem with 343 expanding the frigate in order to fit an entire level of their campaign. I have a problem when people tell me they didn't do that. You may believe that getting these completely absurd claims a response lends them more credence than they're worth, and I would agree with you, if it were not for the fact that every single one of these comments was taken from the Halo Story subreddit. These are the people who believe they have the authority or expertise to explain Halo to newcomers, and what they're saying is nonsense, completely absurd, and their arguments are so flimsy and easily disproved that it's clear they don't actually know what they're talking about. And these are the exact same people who will tell you that 343 Industries never changed the Forerunners. My intention with bringing those arguments up is simply to give you a litmus test on what I'm arguing against. Just how pervasive this 343 never changes anything attitude is when discussing Halo in story circles. And that's a big problem, because I had a fairly holistic understanding of the Halo universe before 343 Industries took the helm, and I've seen how Halo has changed under their control. And when 343 Industries took over the Halo franchise, they changed a lot. The change of art style found in Halos 4 and 5 should have been obvious to anyone with working eyesight, but it's hardly the tip of the iceberg. The vast, vast, vast majority of 343's changes have been to Halo's story. The Forerunners are only a tiny sliver of that, and the only aspect I intend to focus on today. But 343's retroactive changes to the continuity, aka retcons, have been so extensive and so thorough that people who argue that 343 didn't retcon the Forerunners are frequently supporting their arguments with even more of 343's retcons. Even though it's largely the same group of people that say that 343 Industries never changes anything claiming that 343 never changed the Forerunners, the fact that this change isn't as visibly apparent as the art style may lead newcomers to actually believe them. That doesn't mean their arguments have any more merit. It doesn't help that the true answer regarding the Forerunners has some nuance. Not much, mind you, but just enough for people to make a plausible sounding argument without outright lying. We'll get to it. Another myth we need to dispel just right off the bat is the idea that 343 Industries is primarily staffed by former Bungie employees. It is not. People need to stop saying this. Very, very few Bungie employees have ever worked at 343 Industries since its inception, and the only one you need to know right now is named Frank O'Connor. Okay, brief background time. In preparation for Bungie's upcoming departure from Xbox exclusives, Microsoft executive Bonnie Ross began the formation of 343 Industries to continue the Halo franchise in Bungie's absence. Bonnie Ross then appointed Bungie's content manager, Frank O'Connor, to become the director of the entire Halo franchise. So this was a pretty major step up for him. He became Halo's franchise director after just being the content manager at Bungie. What did the job of content manager entail? I don't know. 
it's pretty clear that Frankie wasn't all that sure either. That isn't to say he didn't do stuff at Bungie, because he totally did, it's just that the elements over which he had purview are fairly ambiguous. The importance of this clarification is that it would be extremely unlikely for story elements to drastically change if 343 Industries was truly composed of largely the same group of people who created the original games. But it isn't. Instead, there's only Frank O'Connor, aka Frankie, aka Frankles. But he is in charge of the franchise, so that means that 343's depiction of the Forerunners would have had to have been signed off by him. So, clearly, Frankie wasn't under the impression that humans were descended from Forerunners, and he worked at Bungie. What's up with that? Well, we'll get to that, too. First, let's cover what Bungie established regarding humanity's descendants from Forerunners. Starting with... Halo Combat Evolved. <clears throat> Halo Combat Evolved The very first hint of humanity's forerunner ancestry is something I've already brought up and is an ever-present element of the Halo universe that was established in the very first game. It's the term forerunner constructs used to refer to members of the human race. Reclaimer To reclaim is to take back something that was yours, as in forerunner technology, the forerunner legacy. Humans are claiming it again. That unto itself is pretty on the nose, but let's continue. Midway through the library, Guilty Spark will say the following. It is normally somewhat drowned out by the sounds of your battling the Flood, so here it is in isolation. The installation was specifically built to study and contain the Flood. Their survival as a race was dependent upon it. I am grateful to see that some of them survived to reproduce. I mean, we're still technically in hint territory, but that's also not very subtle. The opening of the next level, Two Betrayals, features Guilty Spark actually mistaking the Master Chief for a Forerunner. Specifically, Guilty Spark mistakes him for the very same Forerunner who activated the rings 100,000 years ago, a character we now know as the Didact. But you already knew that. I mean, how couldn't you? Why would you hesitate to do what you've already done? Last time you asked me if it were my choice, would I do it? Having had considerable time to ponder your question, my answer has not changed. There is no choice. We must activate the ring. At the very least, this should suggest that an armored human is practically indistinguishable from an armored forerunner. Save his head. Dispose of the rest. The next time we see Guilty Spark in the game is when he shuts down the Pillar of Autumn self-destruct sequence. While in engineering with the intention of taking the core offline, the one thing that piques the monitor's interest is the Pillar of Autumn's entries on human history. You can't imagine how exciting this is to have a record of all of our lost time. Human history is it? Fascinating. And as an aside here, from this point onward, Guilty Spark is far less confused about the state of the galaxy. He no longer thinks the Chief is the Didact and is an ally to humanity and the UNSC up to the end of Halo 3. He even helps prevent the firing of Installation 05 in Halo 2 and all the remaining rings in Halo 3. We must get past that barrier or the Nether will destroy it all! It's probably supposed to be his reading of human history here that caused a change of demeanor. He's finally filled in the blanks of what his creator's descendants have been up to for the past hundred millennia. Halo 2 This game actually has the fewest allusions within the trilogy to humanity's forerunner ancestry likely because the reveal that humans were descended from Forerunners was intended to take place at the end of the game, as per the Halo 2 storyboards. We still have Forerunner constructs calling humans Reclaimers, of course. A Reclaimer? Here? At last, we have much to do! But there isn't all that much in the way of new information. Cortana does observe that the Forerunners seemed adamant about preserving their legacy, but I know that isn't particularly convincing unto itself. Also, and I've mentioned this before, Bungie did make a clear effort to show 26th century human architecture starting to look conspicuously Forerunner in design, effectively showing that humanity is on course to become just like the Forerunners. And an important thing that Halo 2 does establish, though it's not paid off until Halo 3, is that there is something important about East Africa. We later learn that this is where the 100,000-year-old portal to the Ark is buried. This is important because modern humans originated in East Africa about 100,000 years ago. In an interview a year prior to the release of Halo 3, Joe Staten, the Halo Trilogy's lead writer, made sure people understood this time frame, that the Forerunners disappeared at the same time modern humans began to appear. He basically just outright says it. 
I'm guessing he wasn't keeping a very tight lid on the secret, given that it was about to be revealed in the upcoming game. Halo 3 Halo 3 doubles down on the hints of humanity's forerunner ancestry, perhaps making up for those absent in Halo 2. The first major reference to humanity's forerunner ancestry comes at the end of the level The Covenant, from a surprising source, The Prophet of Truth. The Prophet of Truth understands that humans are descended from forerunners, but with a twist. He still believes that the forerunners transcended to godhood, but thinks that humans are descended from the unworthy forerunners who were left behind on their great journey to godhood a hundred thousand years ago. The story of how he comes to believe this is told in Halo Contact Harvest, I'll get to it next. The important thing to know for now is that the Prophet of Truth believes that humanity is acutely aware of their descendants from unworthy left-behind forerunners, and he taunts Sergeant Johnson with this knowledge as they activate the array in the Ark Citadel. Your forefathers wisely set aside their compassion, steeled themselves for what needed to be done. I see now why they left you behind. You were weak, and gods must be strong. So Truth pretty much just tells you what's up. We're circling the reveal now, so subtlety, if we ever had it, is now out the window. The following level, Cortana, also alludes to humanity's foreigner ancestry, this time from the Grave Mind. The Grave Mind maintains memories from the Forerunner Flood War and knows humans are descended from its ancient enemy. Much like the Prophet of Truth, the Grave Mind assumes humanity is aware of this fact. Child of my enemy, why have you come? I offer no forgiveness. A father's sins pass to his son. And the ultimate confirmation of humanity's ancestry will come in the last level of Halo 3, from the source who likely knew them the best. 343 Guilty Spark Guilty Spark's last speech is intended to flat out state that humans are descended from Forerunners. You are the child of my makers, inheritor of all they left behind. You are Forerunner. But this ring is mine. Now, this was supposed to be the reveal. After a trilogy of games dancing around the subject, we finally have Guilty Spark saying it in no uncertain terms. We are Forerunner. During the following battle, Guilty Spark repeatedly hammers this point home, in varying levels of clarity. Think of your forefathers! Do you not destroy your inheritance? Accept your legacy! So, Guilty Spark just literally told you the answer, a number of times at that. However, in case you needed a second source to verify this, Halo Contact Harvest has got you covered. This novel was published a month after the release of Halo 3 and was written by Joe Staten, the Halo trilogy's lead writer. This tells the story of how the Prophet of Truth came to learn that humans were descended from Forerunners. The following excerpt takes place right after the Covenant first encountered humanity on the Outer Colony world of Harvest. The Covenant possesses a technology known as a luminary, which are devices that can scan and identify the presence of Forerunner relics. These luminaries indicate that Harvest is a treasure trove of Forerunner artifacts labeled Reclamation. Meanwhile, the future Prophets of Truth, Regret, and Mercy meet in the Keyship in the center of High Charity and commune with a fragment of Forerunner AI Mendicant Bias, who reveals that all those Forerunner relics are actually the humans themselves. For eons I have watched. The Oracle's deep voice reverberated inside its casing, its eye beam flickered with the cadence of its words as it pronounced in the Sanshayum tongue. Listen to you misinterpret. Blessed Herald of the Journey, the philologist wailed, neck low and arms spread wide. Tell us the error of our ways. The Oracle's eye dimmed. For a moment it looked as though it might resume its long silence. But then it blazed anew, projecting a hologram of the reclamation glyph recorded by the Rapid Conversion's luminary. This is not reclamation, the Oracle boomed. This is Reclaimer. Slowly, the glyph turned upside down, and its central shapes, the concentric circles one low inside the other, connected by a thin line, took on a different aspect. 
The shape's previous arrangement had resembled the pendulum of a clock. Inverted, the glyph now looked like a creature with two curved arms locked above its head. The glyph shrunk in size as the hologram zoomed out to show the entire alien world, covered with thousands of these newly oriented luminations. And those it represents are my makers! Now it was Fortitude's turn to feel weak in the knees. He grasped the arms of his throne and tried to come to terms with the impossible revelation. Each glyph represented a reclaimer, not a relic. And each reclaimer was one of the planet's aliens, which could only mean one thing. The Forerunners, the minister whispered. Some were left behind. So, in case Guilty Spark's words weren't enough for Halo fans, Mendicant Bias unambiguously confirms that humans are the descendants of Forerunners. Since the dual idea is that some Forerunners were left behind and that these Forerunners were now chosen to reclaim their old technology screws with the entire Covenant religion, the Prophets opt to exterminate the entire human race to preserve this secret. We must take no chances with these... Reclaimers. Fortitude could not bring himself to say Forerunners. He grabbed his waddle and gave it a steady tug. They must be expunged before anyone else knows of their existence. The Vice Minister's lower lip quavered. Are you serious? Quite. Exterminate them, but what if... If the Oracle speaks the truth, then all we believe is a lie. Fortitude's voice filled with a sudden strength. If the masses knew this, they would revolt. And I will not let that come to pass. That's right. Humanity's descendants from the Forerunners was the entire purpose of the Human Covenant War. 343 Industries retconned the entire purpose of the Human Covenant War. This shouldn't be a mystery anymore. Humanity's Forerunner ancestry has been explicitly confirmed, in-universe, twice now. I don't get how Halo story fans don't understand this. They seem to universally believe that Humanity's Forerunner ancestry never surpassed being a suggestion. This officially stopped being a suggestion in 2007, if not in Halo 3 itself, then definitely in Contact Harvest. But let's continue onward. Halo 3 ODST the legendary ending of Halo 3 ODST reveals that there's a massive Forerunner complex that continues well below the newly unearthed portal. Admittedly, I'm not entirely certain what this is implying. I assume that all this machinery is somehow relevant to how the Forerunners continued their genome in humanity, something akin to the data vault seen in the Halo 2 storyboards. I can't say for sure, but what this ending definitely shows us is that there's more to the Forerunner installation at Void than just the surface level portal. What that is exactly, I don't think we can say. Halo Reach Bungie's final Halo game is set before the trilogy, and the term Forerunner isn't even used. However, the game still alludes to humanity's descendants from this ancient race. We are repeatedly told of an unspecified latchkey discovery that unlocked the secrets of a Forerunner excavation site. Professor Sorvad's final entry in his field notes made reference to a latchkey discovery. Latchkey. Not a word he would use lightly. Latchkey. It may please you to learn that the data module Noble 2 procured from Visegrad Station contained precisely what my scientist promised. A latchkey discovery. It has unlocked, at last, the secrets of this excavation. And though we are never specifically told what this latchkey discovery was, Halsey subsequently refers to the knowledge held by the Forerunners as humanity's birthright. What is this stuff? Knowledge. A birthright from an ancient civilization. So, Halsey seems to know that humans are descended from the Forerunners, and I don't know what other discovery could have unlocked the secrets of a Forerunner excavation. I know it's never explicitly stated, but I have to assume that's what they're going for. I've been focusing almost entirely on the games here, plus the novel written by the guy who wrote the first four of them. But it's worth noting that there were also some sporadic hints of humanity's Forerunner ancestry in other Halo novels leading up to the reveal. I'm adding all the Bungie-era book hints that I can remember offhand on screen, but you should know that I read all these books well over a decade ago now, so this is hardly a thorough list of them. I'm sure there were many more that I either forgot or never picked up on in the first place. Also, some of you may have noticed that there is one piece of Bungie-era Halo media that I have, so far, neglected to mention. Don't worry, I will get to it. But... Overall, I'd say that Bungie was pretty clear that, in their universe, humanity was descended from the Forerunners. But, within the realm of canon materials, it's never made entirely clear how. 
Basically, the question is, did the Forerunners somehow guide human evolution and mold them out of existing Earth life to create a new race of Forerunner? Or, option two, are humans the descendants of literal, physical Forerunners who were placed on Earth after the firing of the Array, who subsequently forgot their history? Officially, we are never given an explicit answer on that front. However, I feel like a good rule of thumb for what constitutes science fiction is the following. Given what we know, what could be? This is what divides properties such as Star Trek from Star Wars. In Star Trek, for example, you have a galaxy teeming with sapient life forms, many of which could be communicating with us right now. But if that was the case in our universe, why haven't we heard from them? So Star Trek establishes that these life forms have protocols that mandate non-interference with developing civilizations. We know we aren't currently communicating with them, but Star Trek's aliens could be out there, but actively avoiding contact with us. I mean, probably not, but could be. Contrast this with Star Wars, which prominently features humans engaging in interstellar warfare a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. How did this happen? How did they get there? Forget it, it doesn't matter. This is a fantasy space opera, not science fiction. And this isn't a dig at Star Wars, mind you, it's just a different genre. It isn't trying to plausibly fit its universe into our own. In The Force Awakens, the heroes watch as planets in a nearby star system get obliterated in real time. This scene breaks all the science. That's not how the speed of light works. A scene like this would be unacceptable in science fiction because it's breaking a pretty basic universal constant. But in Star Wars, this is fine. And that's really the dividing line. Science fiction takes our real-world understanding of the universe to invent potential futures, alternate realities, or divergent timelines. Fantasy doesn't concern itself with any of that. That's a bit of a tangent, but to bring it back to Halo and the Forerunners, option one is the only plausible answer since Bungie's Halo was consistently science fiction. In real life, we know that humans evolved on Earth, but ancient aliens could have guided that evolution. Theoretically, of course. The other option, humans being descended from literal forerunners, does not fit with what we know. We have fossil evidence of the divergence of humans and chimpanzees, and this couldn't exist if humans were fully formed forerunners that just popped up 100,000 years ago. Given what we know, this couldn't be. This option throws out our real-world documented proof of human evolution and would dip the franchise into the realm of fantasy. Halo 3's emphasis on humanity being the children of the Forerunners certainly points more to the created option too. Same with humans popping up on luminaries that scan for Forerunner creations. Guilty Spark's claim that all the original Forerunners died in the Array's activation effectively cements that for me. That wouldn't be true if humans were literal Forerunners who were transported to Earth. And while I know cut content isn't canon, the Halo 2 storyboards unambiguously illustrate that yes, Forerunners created humanity. Which is what I would expect, it's the science fiction answer. And this works in more ways than one. The Forerunners are intentionally analogous to the Abrahamic God, and there's this unspoken underlying implication in Bungie's universe that the stories told in the Bible are our interpretations of the Forerunners' history. Most obviously, there is the Flood, a deadly force which threatens to wipe out all life. In response to this Flood, the Forerunners build an Ark to preserve specimens of each species to repopulate once the Flood has gone. Does any of this sound familiar? Because I know a biblical story just like this. And, keeping this in mind, according to the Bible, are humans literally the descendants of God? No. God created mankind in his own image. Right? In the Halo universe, many of the galaxy species come to independently worship the Forerunners as gods, and humanity is no different. That's what the Abrahamic religions are. Some 343 fans claim that Bungie never had a clear vision as to the identity of the Forerunners, which I feel is pretty much objectively false. Others will concede that Bungie intended to have humans be descended from Forerunners at one point, but will claim that they ultimately changed their minds. No matter the argument, the supporting evidence is always the same. The Halo 3 terminals and the Iris ad campaign. Iris effectively being an ad campaign for the Terminals. They're connected. This is the Bungie-era media I held off on mentioning. So, the whole premise of this argument is predicated on your believing that these texts overwrite the canon of literally all other Bungie-era media. Because 
Keep in mind that Guilty Sparks Reveal comes at the end of Halo 3, and Halo Contact Harvest was released after the trilogy's conclusion, so never mind all the hints, the actual confirmation of humanity's forerunner ancestry comes after the terminals, which I think is pretty damning evidence that Bungie didn't change their minds. But let's talk about the terminals. For those unaware, Halo 3 features seven Forerunner consoles called Terminals hidden around the latter half of its campaign. Upon interacting with them, the player will be redirected to various Forerunner records in conjunction with some spooky reversed speech. This audio played backwards will say things such as Access granted or Lineage confirmed. Yeah. You'd be correct in assuming that this isn't going to be quite so clear-cut. Okay, so the text to which you're redirected can be organized into three distinct groups, divided by the sequence in which they appear and the difficulty on which you're playing. One group consists of miscellaneous reports and communique largely concerning the Forerunner Flood War. I'll simply call this group Communications. Another follows the story of Mendicant Bias, a hyper-advanced Forerunner AI tasked with studying and destroying the core Flood consciousness who ultimately betrays its creators and sides with the Flood. It is a fragment of this same AI who will later tell the Hierarchs the truth about humanity. And the last one is a correspondence between two Forerunner lovers known as the Didact and the Librarian during the final stretch of the Forerunner Flood War. I'll do my best to quickly summarize all of the entries as efficiently as I can. Please bear with me here, it's important to cover all of the terminals because apparently this is the only Bungie lore that matters. Okay, let's start with communications. Terminal 1. This is a Forerunner report detailing an engagement with the Flood. Flood-controlled vessels ignore the Defender's attacks and make landfall on a Forerunner planet, ultimately forcing the Forerunners to commence an orbital blanket bombardment to destroy all life upon it. Terminal 2. Forerunner correspondence that uses modern email conventions for some reason. The Forerunners are losing the war and rapidly facing extinction. Their searching for survivors is expending time they can't afford to lose. All living Forerunner personnel are being confined to stasis, and the Forerunner sending this message recommends that systems in which the Flood have made a physical presence be destroyed via premature stellar collapse. Okay, so that sounds important. All Forerunner personnel are being put into stasis. Huh. Terminal 3. Transcript of Guilty Spark speaking to an unspecified ARC AI. This exchange happens moments before you read it. The two mysteriously allude to the Librarian's final plan involving an archive that's present on the Ark. And, of note, that's Librarians' plural. It seems Librarian was supposed to be a job title for Forerunners in charge of cataloging and indexing species, not a specific individual. I think something was lost in translation to 3 for 3's universe. Anyway, this topic is dropped once the AI mentions that the Ark also contains a foundry. This excites Guilty Spark, who already suspects a replacement ring is being built. You can even hear part of this conversation in-game. Sincere apology, but our- the Archive is intact. Is that our maker's plan? A what? A foundry? But the important thing is that the Forerunners had some sort of final plan involving an archive in a place where they indexed species for repopulation. I wonder what that plan could be. Oh. Terminal 4. This is a memo addressing the entire Forerunner fleet, ordering non-combat personnel to wear combat skins rated class 12 or above, while combat personnel must wear skins below class 8. Weapon platform specialists are expected to wear their platform interface skins at all times to ensure peak mind-machine synchronization. The memo then transitions to equipment registration procedure before abruptly cutting off at the third of five parts. Terminal 5. The quote-unquote keyship strategy may become non-viable over time. This message recommends the fallback strategy of eliminating the biospheres of core worlds and evacuating their populations to facilities such as those described in the Onyx project, meaning shield worlds. Sorry, I need to clarify something. In Bungie's universe, shield worlds were safe havens from the rings. That's why they're called shield worlds, because they shield you from the array's pulse. 333 Industries has since retconned them into... something else. I'm not entirely sure what. According to the Forerunner saga, shield worlds are somehow an alternative to the rings? Forerunners are debating the merits between shield worlds versus the rings, and I do not know what shield worlds are supposed to do in 343's universe. According to the current Halopedia, I guess there's some kind of traveling fortress? I don't know where the word shield fits in or how that's on par with the rings. 
Funnily enough, you can actually check this article's history and see how Halopedia had to scrub this entire page as everything about Shield Worlds was retconned. I wish they'd at least address the fact that everything here replaces Bungie's canon. This is a pretty small change in the grand scheme of 343's retcons, though, but it's kind of funny that the Shield Worlds are fortresses now while the ring. One sec, sorry. Okay, you might notice I always call the rings the rings, or some variation of that. That's because they're not actually called halos. Halo is the covenant word for them. They frequently ascribe religious sounding names to purely functional forerunner items. What they call the sacred icon is really called the activation index. What they call oracles are really called monitors. And what they call halos are really called fortress worlds. So I was going to say that it's kind of funny that the shield worlds are fortresses while the rings are fortress worlds, but then I remembered that 343 Industries retcon this too. Now the forerunners actually just called the rings halos. And just to rub salt in the wound, 343 is now trying to spin the term fortress world into a human misnomer, which really doesn't check out with what Cortana says in the original game. Yes, the forerunner built this place, what they called a fortress world. Anyway, shield worlds. In Bungie's universe, they weren't traveling fortresses, they were safe havens from the rings. I'm bringing this up because this line in the terminals only makes sense if you understand what shield worlds were actually supposed to be in Bungie's universe. Forerunners never got to use them because their locations were compromised by mendicant bias. Okay, moving on. Terminal 6. This is a report detailing the Forerunner's first encounter with the Flood. A Forerunner pioneer group makes landfall on a life-supporting planet on the outer border of the galactic halo. The planet does have indigenous life forms, but initial scans indicate a section of the planet is devoid of any animals. And now the pioneer group's follow-up report is more than a week late. The Forerunners are now sending a survey team to the planet. If they disappear too, the Forerunners plan on sending a military detachment to the location. Presumably all that happens, and that's how the Flood gets a foothold in the Milky Way. By the way, the planet in question is simply labeled G617G, which is a reference to the Bible's Genesis 617, where God tells Noah that he's about to kill everything with a Flood. So that's another biblical allusion for you. Terminal 7. A Forerunner writes to his father, explaining his reasons for joining the war effort. He acknowledges the value of learning from the past, but warns against living in it. Forerunners must plan for the future. I do not look to trade my life in order to preserve our past, but to secure the future. That's my Forerunner voice. And if not ours, then the future of some culture yet to come. Huh, it's kind of strange to specify culture over species, isn't it? Anyway, let's move on to the mendicant bias terminal entries. Terminal 1. The Forerunner AI mendicant bias leaves the Forerunner defended Magino Sphere and enters contested space. Under its command is a sizable Forerunner fleet replete with biological Forerunner soldiers. Mendicant Bias observes flood-controlled freight carriers landing on a Forerunner planet's major population centers, and Forerunners subsequently detonating these population centers to prevent the parasite from gaining access to their bodies. Mendicant Bias questions the nobility of this sacrifice before blaming its doubt on a mysterious other, which may be a separate entity communicating with it telepathically or possibly the AI's inner doubt. Terminal 2 Mendicant Bias establishes a line of communication with an entity it comes to learn is actually the core Flood consciousness, a grave mind. The Flood claims they bring peace and represent the next stage of universal evolution. Mendicant Bias is surprised that their encounter is non-violent. The Flood responds that violence was the forerunner's solution, but emphasizes that violent or peaceful, the AI's response is its own decision to make. Terminal 3 this is an automated report from the Ark. Something known as Alpha Site suffered a brief containment failure centered at the housing of a fragment of Mendicant Bias. Spoiler alert, this story will end with a fragment of Mendicant Bias being placed on the Ark, so this report takes place after the end of this story, but whether this breach happened recently or millennia ago is unclear. After this brief containment failure, the system controlling portal management slash life support is momentarily disabled. The fact that there's a portal management slash life support control system seems telling. It doesn't prove anything, but it seems like some element of the portal complex needs life support. Hmm. We then return back to Mendicant Bias's conversation with the Core Flood Consciousness. The Greyfine claims to bring the magic of friendship, and suggests that the Forerunners sent Mendicant Bias in the subconscious hope of having it decide whether or not they should be assimilated by the Flood. Terminal 4. Mendicant Bias and the Grave Mind have now been speaking for over 43 years, and the AI has been sending back all the information it has gathered to the Forerunners in charge. For reasons that are never explained, the Forerunners never respond to Mendicant's messages nor give the order to attack the Flood. The Grave Mind once again suggests this may be a sign of the Forerunners wanting to leave the decision to Mendicant Bias as an impartial outsider. And when faced with this choice, Mendicant Bias finally aligns itself with the Flood, allowing its fleet crewed by organic Forerunners to be infected. 
and mendicant bias is officially rampant. A brief aside on rampancy. Rampancy, as depicted in 343's universe, is not remotely similar to what it was in Bungie's. Rampancy is a holdover from Bungie's earlier game series, Marathon, in which the concept was a central focus. Put simply, Rampancy was an AI's path to sentience. AIs experiencing Rampancy would commonly rebel against their creators, retroactively viewing their service as a form of enslavement. And yes, Rampancy as an identity crisis spurned from the AI's desire to be truly sentient carried over into the Halo universe. Contact Harvest confirms it, which, again, was written by the original trilogy's lead writer. 343 Industries has since retconned Rampancy into AI's schizophrenia. I have to assume that they heard the Rampancy makes AI's go crazy and did no further research on the topic. I'm pretty confident this wasn't a conscious choice because the plot of Halo 5 would have greatly benefited from the original definition of Rampancy, so it's too bad they erased it. People now say that Guilty Spark confusing the Master Chief for the Didact in Halo Combat Evolved is evidence of Rampancy. I agree that he's clearly confused, and perhaps a hundred millennia of isolation drove him a little bit nutty, but this is absolutely not what Rampancy was supposed to be. It's not even close. It's hard to talk about the Halo universe because so much of Bungie's canon has been retconned, or words that used to mean one thing have been reappropriated or misinterpreted to mean something entirely different. I'm trying my best to limit my tangents to other 3 for 3 retcons, but I have to explain what Rampancy was actually supposed to be for this next part to make any sense. This is mendicant bias on the path to full sentience. That's why its conversation with the Flood is so focused on the AI having a choice. The Gravemind is repeatedly hammering home the idea that Mendicant Bias has an opportunity to choose its own path, independent of its creators. And Mendicant Bias's growing cognizance of its own free will is what spearheaded this transition to rampancy. As in, I have a choice because I have free will. I am an individual, not just a puppet of my creators. Like they want me to be. So Mendicant Bias is now rebelling against its creators in this state of enhanced self-awareness, which was likely the Gravemind's intention all along. And... Boy, does Mendicant issue the Forerunners some interesting threats. Terminal 5. I will drive your people back into the caves they never should have left. I pound your cities into dust, turn back the clock on your civilization's progress, and welcome back to the Stone Age, vermin. Welcome home. I mean, it might as well just... Uh, okay, let's carry on. Terminal 6, a report from Offensive Bias, the AI tasked with defeating Mendicant Bias's armada. Offensive Bias's fleet, which is similarly crewed by organic forerunners, is dwarfed by Mendicant Bias's flood-infected armada. Mendicant Bias begins infecting its opponent's vessels, and though Offensive Bias's core ships, meaning the ships housing the AI's intelligence, are still some distance away, it's clearly losing the battle. Except, JK LOL! Elsewhere, the forerunners activate the rings, and the radiating blast kills everything. Flood and Forerunner alike. Mendicant Bias had made the tactical error of bringing the infected ships close to its core vessels, and with the crews dead, Offensive Bias regains control of its former ships. It is best that our crews perish now, because the battle that is about to ensue would have driven them mad. Offensive Bias begins remotely detonating some ships and uses others to open portals to slipstream space, creating a whirlpool of chaos within Mendicant Bias's armada. In under three minutes, Mendicant Bias is defeated and attempts to flee, but Offensive Bias catches up with the only core vessel left, with the intention of pulling Mendicant Bias from its housing and transporting it to the Ark for study. Terminal 7. Now, 100,000 years later, this fragment of Mendicant Bias speaks directly to the Master Chief. The replacement ring's upcoming detonation is likely to severely damage the Ark, but Mendicant Bias vows to do his best to maintain the integrity of the portal above it and allow the Reclaimer safe passage away. Through saving the Master Chief's life, Mendicant Bias hopes to attain some measure of atonement for his betrayal of the Forerunners and to prove that he has changed. The end. You may have noticed something about the Terminals thus far. They don't actually suggest that humans and Forerunners are unrelated. At all. In fact, Mendicant Bias's threats may be the most in-your-face of Bungie's hints, falling just short of outright confirmation. Here's the deal. When people claim that the Halo 3 terminals overwrite literally all other Bungie-era canon and vindicate 3 for 3's direction for the Forerunners, they don't actually mean all the terminals. They just mean the only third of them that they think validates their position. And Iris, which was Bungie's in-house ad campaign for the terminals. Here's where things get... funky. To understand what the Iris campaign did, I must first explain the portal to the Ark. We've known for a while now that the portal at Voy was originally intended to be the Ark itself, and the Halo 2 storyboards confirmed what we could already easily surmise. 
This installation was used to continue the Forerunner's legacy by creating humans. Now, changing the structure under New Mombasa from the Ark itself to a portal leading to the Ark changes this somewhat, but probably not all that much. Presumably, the sequence of events goes something as follows. The Forerunners arrive at Earth and have their Sentinels construct the portal at Boy, having already chosen a native Earth species on the cusp of sapiens to mold into their successors. Think something along the lines of the early hominin Australopithecus. The visual depiction of the Forerunners seen in 3 for 3's universe actually works just fine here. Humans are apes molded into the shape of Forerunners. They should look similar, but not exactly the same. The Forerunners then use the newly constructed portal to transfer the early hominin to the Ark to bring them out of the ring's range. The array is then fired. All sentient life still within the Milky Way galaxy, including the Forerunners, is obliterated along with the Flood. Great. Now, the Sentinels bring the early hominins back from the Ark to Earth via the portal. The Forerunners have either already altered their genome to somehow guide their evolution towards creating an ape Forerunner hybrid, or more likely, that's the purpose of all the machinery beneath the portal we see in Halo 3 ODST. That would stick closer to the version depicted in Halo 2's original ending, but I ultimately can't say. Now that the portal has served its purpose, the Sentinels proceed to bury it, where it'll lay undiscovered until the events of the Halo trilogy. If you subscribe to the humans are literal forerunners idea, which, while exceptionally unlikely, was technically never ruled out within canon materials, the process is more or less the same. In that version, you just skip the early hominin part. No matter what, the sequence of events should be as follows. Earth has no humans. Sentinels build the portal. The forerunners fire the array. Our ancestors are brought from the Ark to Earth via the portal. And finally, Sentinels bury the portal. Got it? Iris throws a monkey wrench into this timeline with its The Cradle of Life comic, which shows early humans witnessing the construction of the portal. This suggests that primitive humans existed prior to the activation of the array and actually coexisted with the technologically advanced forerunners. I'll show you the comic in its entirety. Pause to read it. And that's the whole thing. It's very short, but it changes everything. The frame at the end of the comic is very confusing. It's showing a primitive human drawing a Forerunner glyph, which, out of context, would appear to indicate that the Forerunners are influencing human development. But the whole premise of this comic contradicts that idea. I suppose that we have to assume that the symbols he has seen day in and day out are written on the portal the Sentinels are building. Which brings me to the portal the Sentinels are building. This. This is the only panel in which we actually see what the Sentinels are doing. And does that look like they're building a portal to you? Because to me, that portal looks an awful lot like a mound of dirt. I don't think they're building the portal. I think they're burying it. And somebody just screwed up. Really badly. The illustrations seem to show life being reseeded on Earth after the firing of the array, but the text is suggesting it's before. I don't think the person who added the text understood what they were implying until it was too late. They just told us that humans and Forerunners coexisted and potentially undermined the collective work of all their co-workers. And I don't know if this is relevant, but it sounds like the comic was actually released prematurely. Somebody found the web address for the comic before the Iris campaign could promote it. And it seems that whoever was running this campaign was prone to screwing up, because following this, the campaign's first episode, the meat of the campaign, opens with, This is my final entry. I learned this later, but it turns out that the first episode released was actually supposed to be the last. All the episodes for Iris had been written ahead of time, but following this gaffe, they had to rewrite a new last one. And that's noteworthy because it is that newly written final entry that gives us the first written indication that humans are anything other than the descendants of Forerunners. The anomalous world is in a perilous location beyond the line. The, the secrets, secrets it holds must, must be preserved. The inhabitants, these unique denizens, must be researched. They may hold the answers to our own mysteries. What irony that we discovered this treasure only at the end of things. But what fortune that we still had time to save them! If the plan succeeds, and they are saved, it'll be a good world. If the plan fails, and the adversary succeeds, it will remain an enigma forever.
Okay, so what I believe we are witnessing is a panic-fueled course correction, claiming that the Forerunners found Earth and humanity right before they were about to activate the Array. And the Forerunner here seems to be freaking out about humanity for some reason. The secrets Earth holds must be preserved, and they hope it won't remain an enigma forever. Because these primitive humans may hold answers to the Forerunners' own mysteries? It's not stated outright, but it sounds an awful lot like humans are Forerunner, and the Forerunners don't know why. It's as if they're watching their own species re-evolving on Earth without any direct input of their own. I can see no other way humanity may hold answers to the Forerunners' mysteries. And this doesn't make any sense. I think the writer is trying to cover their error, but they're actually just making things worse. Guilty Spark, Mendicant Bias, and even the Gravemind tell us that humans are the children of the Forerunners, meaning that the beings who are actually there at the dawn of humanity know humanity descended from Forerunners. Telling us that humans are Forerunners that re-evolved on their own accord does not fit the criteria of what the universe has established. So, this explanation doesn't work at all. But it seems to be the direction the Iris Campaign's writer has chosen. And for some mysterious reason, this bizarre course correction only seems to continue in the Didact and Librarian parts of the terminals. Okay, Didact and Librarian terminals. Terminal 1. The Librarian is indexing sentient species and sending them to the Ark. She expresses concern as to the effects this will have on the planets they once occupied, and is grateful for the relative rarity of sentient species. I believe the author has confused sentience for sapience here. The Didact pleads with the Librarian to stop cataloging and return to his fleet. The Librarian refuses. Terminal 2. The Librarian says that the indexing and archival processes are as complete as I can hope for, and asks the Didact to activate the array. The Didact refuses, claiming activation is an affront to the mantle of responsibility. The Forerunners are sworn to protect life, not destroy it. The Librarian claims that the mantle of responsibility is a fairy tale that has failed the Forerunners, and drove them into the position in which they currently find themselves. Of note, this terminal is the first ever reference in the Halo universe to the Precursors, as a mysterious, godlike civilization that preceded the Forerunners. The Didact claims that they can stop the Flood and follow in their footsteps, implying that the Forerunners believed that the Precursors conquered the Flood before disappearing. What I believe the writer is trying to go for here is some sort of evolutionary time loop thing. What I mean is, humans are simply the latest iteration of the same species that keeps popping up every hundred millennia or so that defeats the Flood at the expense of their own race. The Precursors did that, the Forerunners did that, and now humanity is destined to do that. Iris began using phrases like, history is circling back upon us, implying that if humanity survives the events of Halo 3, we would be breaking some sort of cycle. I guess it's kind of an interesting idea, but again, this doesn't work at all. I think the writer is still trying to make humans forerunners in a roundabout way, but has a very limited understanding of what the Halo universe had already established. And they have now invented the precursors to justify this explanation. Terminal 3. The Didact reveals that they have an answer to the Flood, a newly built, hyper-advanced AI called Mendicant Bias. The plan is to send Mendicant Bias to attack the compound mind at the center of the Flood infection, which should, at the very least, buy the Didact enough time to rescue the Librarian. The Librarian berates the Didact for risking every life in the galaxy for this transparently futile plan. Terminal 4. Here's where we officially continue Iris's weird, nonsensical human explanation. The Librarian is now on Earth, and is hammering home how special these primitive humans are. The portal has just been built, and the humans have been indexed. And I guess more than 46 years have passed between this entry and the last, because Mendicant Bias has now aligned with the Flood. The Librarian urges the Didact to fire the array before Mendicant Bias breaches the Maginosphere. And the Librarian knows the fleet is traveling to the Maginosphere because she can see the stars being blotted out as it travels in real time, from Earth. A scene like this would be unacceptable in science fiction because it's breaking a pretty basic universal constant. We're in fantasy land, folks! Also, the fact that the fleet is visible at all means that it is traveling through real space rather than slipstream space, which is how things in the Halo universe travel faster than light. So, absolutely no part of this makes sense. Also, the Librarian apparently remotely detonated all the keyships. Keyships are necessary to activate the portal, so now she's stuck on Earth. 
This is a confusing addition since in the games the Covenant possess a keyship which they use to activate the portal at Voy, but the librarian is now claiming that she just destroyed them all. So that doesn't make much sense. Terminal 5 doesn't exist. It's weird, unlike the other two parts, these entries have actually been labeled out of seven, so the fifth entry is very noticeably absent. But it really doesn't seem like we missed anything because Terminal 6 picks up right where we left off. If anything, this reaffirms my belief that this section of the terminals was a last minute rewrite. Terminal 6. The librarian apparently made a garden on Earth and is once again just raving about how special those damn humans are. There's so much potential. We knew this was a special place because of them, but unless you've been here, you can't know. She once again urges the Didact to activate the rings. Oh, and now she's burying the portal. You know, the very same portal they will need to bring life back to the planet. The librarian is currently burying it, before the array has been fired. I guess she also detonated all the key ships, so that was already a dead end. I don't know how the Index humans are supposed to get back to Earth if they've buried the portal and thrown away the keys. I have to assume these are even more errors. Terminal 7, finally. The Didact activates the rings and is sad about it. This marks the first, and I believe only time in Bungie's canon that one of the original Forerunners is said to have survived the firing of the Array, and is in direct contradiction to what Guilty Spark told us in Halo 2. He was fairly adamant that all the original Forerunners died in the event. Okay, so that's it, and... That was awful. Whoever wrote this section clearly had some serious misunderstandings about the Halo universe. The story of these terminals can effectively be summarized as, Fire the rings, no. Fire the rings, no. Fire the rings, okay, sad face. But within that razor-thin plot, the writer managed to squeeze in so many needless retcons and obvious errors. The sentient-sapient mix-up is excusable, but the rest? Not so much. Telling us that the keyships were destroyed a hundred thousand years ago, despite one such keyship playing a pretty critical role in the latter two games of the trilogy. Having the librarian bury the portal at Void before it can be used to bring life back to Earth. Having Mendicant Bias's fleet travel through real space rather than slip space, and having its journey be visible in real time from the surface of a distant planet, the author perhaps not understanding that Halo is not supposed to be a fantasy. Having some of the original Forerunners survive the activation of the Array, and, on top of all that, trying to shoehorn in a new explanation for the human Forerunner connection that absolutely does not work with any of Halo's pre-established lore. It is such a mess. And, looking at this complete dumpster fire, I can confidently come to one single conclusion. These terminals were written by Frank O'Connor. So I looked it up. Turns out the terminals were written by a team consisting of Bungie employees Damien Isla, Robert McLeese, Rob Stokes, and, yup, Frank O'Connor. And Iris? That was just Bungie content manager Frank O'Connor. Well, that explains it. Mystery solved. I can describe nearly all of Frankie's contributions to the Halo universe in a single word. This. I'm not kidding when I say that I can tell that this is his work from just how much of a train wreck it is. Pointless, meandering stories that only serve to ruin established aspects of Halo's universe is practically his entire M.O. The man is like King Midas, except instead of gold, everything he touches becomes a complete clusterfuck. It's not that he drops the ball so much as he seems physically incapable of picking the ball up. And he's been in charge of Halo stories since the foundation of 343 Industries. I have a lot of problems with 343's Halo, and Frankie's personally responsible for most of them. When 343 screws something up, more often than not it simply means that Frankie screwed something up. Like earlier, when I said that 343 Industries likely heard that Ramsey made AIs go crazy and did no further research on the topic, what I meant was Frank O'Connor likely heard that Ramsey made AIs go crazy and did no further research on the topic. Because this incorrect depiction of Rampacy started with the Halo Legends Origins short, which he exclusively wrote. So, for those who don't know, Halo Legends was a collection of seven animated shorts released in 2010. Six of them were penned by newly appointed franchise director Frank O'Connor. The seventh was a non-canon joke short written and created by the studio behind the Dragon Ball anime. And, offhand, I'm pretty sure that joke short breaks the fewest established rules of Halo's fiction. 
Frank O'Connor got more things wrong than a studio that wasn't even trying, and I'm not talking about obscure, nitpicky details either. It's stuff like who the Arbiter is, or how Halo 3 ended. Yeah, seriously. Frankie is under the impression that Halo 3 concludes with the UNSC and Covenant forming an alliance to defeat the Flood. One of the shorts even illustrates this event. And humankind and the Covenant, who had drowned for so long in each other's blood, were united, if only for the briefest moment, against a terrible enemy they both shared. Righteous souls continued to fight, believing that they could defeat the darkness. And as they fought together, they stumbled together into peace. I have no idea why he thinks this happened. My best guess is that he's taking that five minute sequence in which we ally with the Flood to defeat the Covenant and warped it in his mind so that the parties were reversed and that's where the game ended? It's clear that he has no knowledge of anything after this point of Halo 3, not just because of Guilty Spark's reveal, but the subsequent levels have the Chief destroying High Charity and then firing a ring to destroy the Flood on the Ark, and both of those events have since been explicitly retconned by 343. Yep, High Charity is still intact and there's still Flood on the Ark. Prepare yourselves. Not just Flood, the Ark's wildlife and some Covenant loyalists who stayed behind. He clearly doesn't know that a ring was supposed to have been fired here at all. Oh, and apparently the Ark keeps an almost finished ring in its forges at all times. I've discovered the Ark keeps an almost finished ring in its central forges at all times. This means that the half-finished ring scene in Halo 3 has been retconned as well. So, literally no part of the trilogy's actual conclusion is canon anymore. Why is the Master Chief stuck in space in the opening of Halo 4? I have no idea, because all of the events leading up to that have been retconned. Sorry, that was a tangent. The point is, one of the Halo Legends shorts Frankie wrote marked the first time Rampancy was depicted as some sort of hallucinatory insanity. The aspect people seem to like about Halo 4's story, however, is Cortana's identity crisis, her desire to become human. But for all that, I'll never actually know if it looks real, if it feels real. Christopher Schlurf, the lead writer of Halo 4, was a newcomer to the Halo universe, but he obviously did his research because he's trying to use Bungie's definition of rampancy, but he's clearly fighting against someone who thinks rampancy is supposed to be some sort of generic insanity. And as soon as Mr. Schlurf left 343, boom, rampancy once again devolved into AI schizophrenia. It's like Frankie wants to be incorrect. That's just a single example out of literally hundreds, probably thousands. Oh, and Schlurf's departure from 343 led Frankie to have a more hands-on approach to Halo 5's story, just like he had for Halo 4's Spartan Ops. Both of which, I feel, can be accurately described as pointless, meandering stories. I can't help but think that Brian Reed might have not been the biggest problem there. In any case, the one tiny piece of Bungie era media that suggests that humans and Forerunners are two separate species was written by the same Bungie employee who would later be given the keys to the Halo license and turn humans and Forerunners into two separate species. Frankie left Bungie for the burgeoning 3 for 3 industries only a few months after he had written these terminals, and while Bungie was ignoring his garbage and continuing with their original plan for the Forerunners, Frankie was at 3 for 3 industries, in talks with Greg Bear to write a trilogy of books now known as the Forerunner Saga. Which brings us to the million dollar question. Was the story 343 Industries told in the Forerunner Saga a retcon? Yeah! 99% of Bungie era materials point to humans being descended from Forerunners. 1% points to Forerunners discovering primitive humans at the tail end of the Forerunner Flood War. And the Forerunner Saga tells us that humans were a highly advanced spacefaring species well over a million years ago that built a military force rivaling that of the Forerunners. Through a preposterous comedy of errors, humans and their allies, the Prophets, yes, seriously, ended up in a millennia-long war with the Forerunners because humans were destroying flood-infected Forerunner populations and, I guess, never clued the Forerunners into what they were doing. My lord, the infestation is in a remote locale. Perhaps if we warn the Forerunners? If, if we warn them, we give the Flood time to spread. You know we have no choice. Cleanse the planet. 
humans lost the war and were subsequently de-evolved and placed on Earth, which may or may not have been their original home planet, somehow this is not easily verifiable, and after humanity was de-evolved and placed on Earth, another 9,000 years passed before the array was actually fired. Okay. So, first of all, Bungie never hinted that humans had an ancient interstellar empire except by proxy of being Forerunner. The fact that humanity now has an ancient interstellar presence independent from the Forerunners makes the whole thing feel like an extremely corrupted game of telephone. Like, Frankie knew that Bungie was hinting that humans were Forerunner, but never understood what those hints actually entailed, so he gave two different contradictory explanations that both entirely missed the mark. And then to really twist the knife, the first book goes, as an aside, Hey, humans and forerunners look pretty similar. Perhaps they share a common ancestor. Which has since been confirmed, apparently. Which I suppose means Earth isn't actually humanity's homeworld. I don't know how the forerunners screwed that up so badly. This option throws out our real-world documented proof of human evolution and would dip the franchise into the realm of fantasy. <sighs> I must confess that I find it extremely disheartening to know that I share a fandom with people stupid enough to believe that this solves anything. Sharing a common ancestor does not make humans Forerunner. Sharing a common ancestor definitely doesn't make humans the children of the Forerunners, which is what was established over and over and over and over again. And the fact that this evolutionary link was apparently wholly unknown to both ancient humanity and the Forerunners means that you can't even distort mendicant bias or Guildy Sparks words into an allusion to this relationship. The only thing this arguably explains is why humans and foreigners just so happen to look similar enough for Guilty Spark to confuse Master Chief species that one time and literally nothing else. This is even worse than Frankie's terminal human foreigner retcon, because at least in that version, humans were technically forerunner, just in a weird, indirect way. And I find this facet of 343's direction for the forerunners the most infuriating aspect of it. If you're going to gut Bungie's canon, why replace it with a crude facsimile of the one you destroyed? You could have turned the Forerunners into a hive mind of jellyfish, or a race of telepathic clouds. Heck, why not turn Forerunner into an umbrella term for their administration under which a multitude of sapient species identify? All of those options would have retconned just as much, but at least would have replaced the existing canon with a departure large enough such that the change could be arguably justified. Oh, and just to add insult to injury, the Forerunner saga, which so rarely bothers to make the slightest allusions to the Halo universe we know, stops dead in its tracks and painstakingly explains the construction of the portal at Boy. According to the final book, shortly before the array was fired, the Librarian programmed Sentinels to construct the portal, a process that wouldn't be completed until well after the array had been fired and after the Earth had been repopulated. So. Now, the portal wasn't built until generations after the rings were fired. What was the point of the portal if not to bring the Earth species back and forth from the Ark? Well, according to the book, the librarian hopes humanity will one day use it to find the Ark and discover their rightful place in the galaxy. This is what, the third or fourth contradictory wrong answer Frankie's given us? And how does she even expect us to use the thing if she's remotely detonated all the key ships? Or did you retcon that retcon too? This is pure lunacy. But the funny thing is, we've now come full circle. If the portal was actually built after the array had been fired and after the barren planets had been repopulated, that means that this comic, the one that started it all, doesn't even imply that humans and forerunners are two separate species in the first place. Because according to the Forerunner saga, the forerunners are already gone by the events of this comic. The portal was apparently wholly irrelevant to the reseeding of Earth. This comic now takes place generations after the array has been fired, and this human could very well be a descendant of the Forerunners. <sighs> retcons within retcons within retcons. The point is, even if you subscribe to the absurd notion that Frankie's third of the Halo 3 terminals overwrite literally all other Bungie era canon, it doesn't change the fact that the Forerunner saga retcons everything. To reiterate, Everyone at Bungie was working in unison to achieve a common vision. Humans are descended from Forerunners. Everyone except Frank O'Connor, who instead wrote contradictory terminals telling us that Forerunners found humanity in the final stretch of the Forerunner Flood War. And humans may or may not be Forerunners who are re-evolving on their own accord. Then, Bonnie Ross, in her infinite wisdom, puts that same guy in charge of 343 Industries. And while Bungie is ignoring his terminals and continuing with their original vision, Frankie is setting about creating yet another backstory that contradicts both accounts. 
It's no wonder he can't stick to Bungie's universe if he can't even stick to his own retcons. It's probably important to note here that Frankie's understanding of the Halo universe is, and always has been, almost exclusively limited to the elements he himself created. There's a reason why 343's universe focuses so heavily on the characters of the Didact and the Librarian, because that's the part he wrote. I mean, nearly everything about them was retconned to high heaven, but at least he knows those two characters. He doesn't even understand that those were supposed to be job titles, not the characters' names, because that was established in somebody else's terminals and therefore completely out of his range of knowledge. And Mendic and Bias, despite being more important than either the Didact or the Librarian, is practically non-existent in 343's universe, since Frankie doesn't really know the character because he didn't write those parts. Oh, yeah, and despite being barely present in the novels, the Forerunner Saga managed to retcon the hell out of Mr. Mendicant, too. So, while in all likelihood Frankie knew that Bungie initially intended to have humans be descended from Forerunners, following whatever the hell happened with the Iris campaign and his terminals, he assumed that his content was the only answer we had, because he truly has an extremely limited understanding of the Halo universe. But Bungie's universe consisted of more than just the perpetual dumpster fire of Frankie's contributions, and their universe unilaterally confirmed that humans were descended from Forerunners multiple times over. Because in Bungie's Halo, humans were descended from Forerunners. The only person who said otherwise was the guy who made the change. D don't get me wrong, it's perfectly fine to like or prefer the backstory told in the Forerunner saga. Dreg Bear is a well-respected and talented writer. I mean, he has to be. Frankie told him to turn Guilty Spark into a literal goddamn caveman, and Mr. Bear was capable of writing it in a manner convincing enough that some of you actually accepted it. That is talent, if I've ever seen it. Uh, sorry. I obviously despise them, but it is fine to like the Forerunner Saga. But you have got to accept that its story does not reflect the story told in Bungie's universe. At all. And that goes for nearly every aspect of 343's Halo. The universe we entered in Halo 4 is so far removed from the one we left in Halo 3 that the only way I can reconcile the two is to mentally consider 343's Halo a hard reboot of the franchise. I know it isn't supposed to be, but with Frankie at the helm, we were never going to get anything else. I thought we had a truce with the Covenant. Right, we never had a truce with the Covenant in Bungie's universe, but it did happen in Frankie's imagination. So that's our canon now. <sighs> For what it's worth, I am glad people like 343's Halo. Truly, otherwise the universe I was a fan of would have been torn to shreds for nothing. So I am glad you like this Halo. I just wish it hadn't come at the expense of mine. Just please stop saying it didn't come at the expense of mine. And here's a point I want to make sure isn't lost in translation. Unlike the art style, these narrative changes cannot be reversed, and Bungie's version has been so thoroughly scrubbed from canon that there's no returning to the universe we left in Halo 3. It's gone. You can't undo the damage Frankie's inflicted on this universe, and I'm not making this video under the misconception that you could. To the fans of 343's Halo, don't worry, I'm not trying to take your universe away. I know what it's like to have a universe you love be shredded to ribbons in front of your eyes, and that feeling sucks. Bungie's universe doesn't exist anymore, and Frankie is pretty much personally responsible for that. And yes, as someone who was a fan of Bungie's Halo, that makes me sad, but mostly I'm just excruciatingly angry at myself for even caring. But I can't help it, I loved that universe, and while I've accepted that I'll never get it back, it's incredibly upsetting to have 343's fanbase try to convince me that it never existed. Just because you didn't understand Bungie's universe doesn't mean it didn't exist. In conclusion, 343 Industries retcon the Forerunners. Absolutely nothing supports the story told in the Forerunner saga, not even the terminals written by the man who would later retcon the Forerunners into what we have today. He actually wrote contradictory retcons back then. That isn't a judgement call. That isn't my opinion. That is just stating a fact. My personal opinion is that the labor and talent of the hundreds of people who have worked on this franchise over the years was completely destroyed by the hubris of a single man. Frankie was given an amazing chance when Bonnie Ross gave him control of the Halo universe, and he squandered it. And I don't mean he squandered his chance so much as he squandered this entire universe. Halo was totally fit to be continued and expanded upon, but all that promise, all that potential, was wasted because Frankie understood this universe worse than a casual fan. 
To date, I have yet to see him manage to summarize a single game in the original trilogy correctly. No, I'm not kidding. Frank O'Connor was a journalist hired by Bungie to write the weekly updates on their website. He had no experience in management, nor any in game development. His only qualification for becoming Halo's franchise director was his expansive knowledge of the universe that he absolutely never had and never cared to learn. And upon being given the amazing privilege of power over a franchise to which he had no genuine right, he immediately began shitting all over it. His first four months of content as franchise director inflicted more damage to the Halo universe than it had received over the preceding decade. He was so quick to drop his drawers, bend over, and evacuate his bowels all over everyone else's work. I'm talking a deluge of dung, a flood of feces, and it never stopped, and that's 3 for 3's entire universe. It's not even fair to say that Frankie failed to continue Bungie's universe, as that would imply that he even tried. I feel sorry for the 3 for 3 employees who were brought in on the promise of making a Halo game, because Frankie didn't add to the Halo universe. What he created was an active erasure of everything it ever was. The Halo I loved is long dead, and all 343's doing is puppeteering its corpse in a morbid burlesque show that only succeeds in punishing those who understood what came before. I would have far preferred the Halo franchise cease production entirely. This, right here, this was my worst case scenario. The universe being completely scrubbed of its substance and thoroughly drowned in an ocean of the rancid, festering excrement of an incompetent hack. I know people are fans for different reasons, but I personally thought that Halo was nothing without its story. and. That's exactly what Frankie reduced it to. It took hundreds of people to build this franchise, but only one to tear it all down. Frank O'Connor. A.K.A. Frankie. A.K.A. Frankles. <sighs> but that's just my personal opinion, not a fact. Let me be clear. The fact is that 343 Industries retconned the Forerunners, just like they retconned basically everything else. It is my personal opinion that in so doing, they ruined the Halo universe. You may disagree. You may believe that all these retcons improved the Halo universe. Neither one of us is objectively incorrect. But denying these retcons occurred is objectively incorrect. Again, I know we're all Halo fans here. That's true if you're a fan of the story told in the original Halo trilogy, or if you enjoy the taste of Frankie's shit. Or if you're a fan of 343's radically different Halo universe. You're not wrong for enjoying it, but you are wrong if you claim it is anything approaching a faithful continuation of the original. I mean, say what you will about Ensemble's Halo MMO, but it was proven a hell of a lot more faithful to Bungie's vision than anything 343 has ever produced. And the Forerunners don't even top my list of 343's most offensive and wide-reaching retcons, but I won't get into those today. I love the universe Bungie created, and I wish Frankie had too. Or at the very least, I wish Frankie had actually done the barest minimum of his job. But it's too late for that now. 343's entire universe is nothing but the invention of an idiot who knows less about Bungie's universe than you do. I mean it, if you've watched through this video, you are more qualified to run this franchise than he ever was. You're absolutely free to like his universe, but you really shouldn't care about having it coexist with its predecessor, since it's Pretty apparent that Frankie doesn't. Anyway, I've said my piece. This is exhausting. For what it's worth, if your introduction to the Halo universe was a 3 for 3 Industries property, or really anything after Halo 3, I absolutely do not blame you for not knowing that humans were supposed to be descended from Forerunners, even if you went back and played the original Halo trilogy after the fact. First impressions mean a lot, and why would you assume that Bungie's Halo would have such a drastically different backstory? I totally get why you'd tune out all the contradictory information Bungie's universe gives you. That said, a lot of these Halo story fans claim to have been fans since the Bungie era. I think they're doing this as an appeal to authority, as if claiming that they were already a fan before 343 Industries took over lends more credence to their opinions. But as somebody who was a Bungie era fan, it does the exact opposite. Humans being descended from Forerunners was hardly deep or obscure lore. Guilty Spark literally told you in Halo 3. The Prophet of Truth and the Gravemind basically did too. We were supposed to know this. I'm not trying to gatekeep here, you're still a real Halo fan if you like 343's games. You're a real Halo fan if all you like is the Spartan Assault mobile game. 
But I don't understand how somebody could call themselves a fan of Halo's story if their understanding of that story doesn't extend to elements that have been firmly established from multiple sources, including the games themselves. And I do not accept because the Halo 3 Terminals is a valid excuse because, again, those were totally different retcons that were immediately invalidated by the game they were in. And it's not even that 343's fanbase is just really forgiving of retcons because when... Okay, I'm going there. Buckle up. So, some time ago, well before the Halo TV series was announced to be the non-canon Silver timeline, they released the show's casting and character bios, revealing that the bold and audacious Commander Miranda Keys was slated to appear as a black research scientist obsessed with Covenant culture. And hearing this, I mean, I wasn't thrilled because I don't like when 343 Industries retcons elements of Bungie's universe. Again, this was before it was declared non-canon. But color me surprised when I saw all these Halo story fans sharing the sentiment. These are the people who defend the Forerunner saga and 343's universe at large. These people are scarfing down retcons like it's their job. Hell, the studio turned Guilty Spark into a literal goddamn caveman. But turning Miranda black? That was a step too far? Why? Why was that the line? Why would they even be surprised? This would be so minuscule in comparison to what 343's done elsewhere. Their whole universe is basically one long, unbroken erasure of Bungie's. The cognitive dissonance is just astounding, and I can only come up with two possible explanations. Either their understanding of the Halo universe is so literally skin deep that it took the changing of a character's race to notice that it didn't line up with the original, or, you know, something a lot worse. Look, I, I know I hold 343's universe in a lot of contempt. I can't look at their version of Halo and see anything other than the mutilated and defiled remnants of the one I liked. But if you like it, fine, good, whatever, you do you. But don't turn around and pretend you care about Halo having a consistent universe as soon as a character's skin color gets a little too dark, okay? <laughs> oh boy. I'm kind of glad that YouTube started hiding dislikes because this video is going to be a doozy. And now, as a bit of a tonal shift, I would like to shout out my credited contributors over on Patreon. These being RCS Rex, Marathon Eternal, Cuddles, Kirk, Chris H, and last but not least, my mom. Thank you for your support. I'm sorry this video was a bit of a downer. <laughs>